Okay, good afternoon. So we're going to run through some of the exercises again. This is for uh, Tai Chi Para for Parkinson's. So we're going to go through that. Some of you have been following. Uh, we don't know exactly how many numbers, but uh, one of the things, you know, if you're following, the simplest thing to do is to access the videos aside, aside from, you know, where you're logging in now is uh, YouTube. If you go to YouTube and you hit the subscribe button, when we do this class, it's going to give you a notification and it'll be a reminder. And, you know, the subscription button, for those of you who don't know, is not a, a paid subscription. It's just a subscription to our channel. So that subscription, if you hit that, it's a little red, um, you know, word that says subscribe. Hit that and uh, it'll know that you are watching these and that's, uh, you know, that'll benefit our channel because the more people to watch it, the better because uh, YouTube wants to know that there's people that are following and on top of that, um, you'll have easy access and you have access to every other thing that's on there that we do and you might be interested in watching some of that. So anyways, we're in the shoulder width position. The hands are up like this. Turn. One, two, three. 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 One, two, and stop. Okay, hands over your head like this. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So we're just limbering up, kind of moving the body, get the circulation going. One, two, three. One, two, and stop. Okay, next. Hands up. Reach down. One, two, Three to your right, two, three to your left, two, three. Center, inhale, exhale. Okay, hands up again. Reach down. So this is a little bit of stretch. Go down as far as you can. If, you, if you're very tight, don't force it. And But stretching actually feels good if you're very tight. You know, your muscle goes, starts to scream. If it doesn't like it, it's because your muscle's not letting go and you're fighting. The muscle's fighting your, your stretch because it doesn't like it. But the thing is, you have to learn to release. So muscles, just like your forearm, how do you, how do you stretch this muscle? You stretch it like this. How do you stretch the top of your arm? So... Whichever position you put that muscle in will do either stretch it. So, and when I stretch, if I go like this and I tighten this muscle, it's going to pull my hand down. So in order for this to do that, that actually has to release. But if you don't control that, it doesn't go very far because it doesn't, really, doesn't allow you to do that because it's not releasing. So stretching is really putting that in a position, and you're actually not really tightening here because you're using sort of a, a crutch to help you get that to happen or if you go that. So it gets the muscle group stretching passively. So at the same time, when we go like this and we bend, when we bend like this, you're kind of pushing here, and then this kind of goes into that stretch. So, Or you can actually pull yourself like that or pull yourself like that. And that's what would happen if someone else was doing that. So really, um, we're getting in a position where we're trying to mentally drive the movement and also get our body to cooperate. Okay, now the hands on the waist. This is a circular move. So movement is one of the things I like to focus on, especially with uh, this specific group, because we need to learn to create different patterns. So this is a circular movement and learn to control the musculature to do, get this to happen. So if you have a little trouble, the only way to improve on it is try your best and try to do it. And then over time, you'll improve because you begin to figure out how to do that. Okay, so that's a circular movement. 
and then you reverse it, and that's the opposite. So in Tai Chi, everything that we're doing in motion is somewhat circular. So circular movements create coordination, so the body kind of controls the muscles to do that specific action. Okay. So some of it is kind of imagining what you're doing when you do this, so that that creates this big circle. Okay. Now we're going to cross the forearms, and then we're going to hold the kneecaps, and we're going to make a circular movement. Switch other direction. And and center. Okay, good. Hands on your waist. Now we're going to turn the head side to side. So those that have been doing this a while, we work the whole body. I mean, this, you know, we do these exercises, you know, each and every class. But at the same time, you know, these are just this set of exercises. We have exercises that are somewhat different in every class. So you can imagine how many exercises your body can adapt to. And then back and forth, OK? And then go back to center. Now we're going to tilt. Now we're going to make a circular movement with the head. Reverse. And set up. Hands up. Fold in. Up on your toes. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Okay, one more time. Inhale, exhale. Okay, now we're going to spread our feet, turn our shoulders. So this is just twisting from side to side. Relax the shoulders and arms. Don't hold them stiff and do this. Let it go. Relax your shoulders, let your arms kind of wrap around the body. It's not very forceful, just kind of twisting and let the momentum take your arms around. And center. Okay, shake it out. Okay, deep breathing, hands up. Inhale, exhale. Inhale. Exhale. So, Lucien, actually, um, Sonny said one of the cameras is really, really uh, not as sharp as the other one. So, do we know it's not as good a camera? Is that what that is? Uh, oh, on the back side. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 But is that camera not as good? So, here. Fo oh, okay. Yeah. So anyways, we're here, and we're going to the square stance. So we're just discussing a little bit of a technical difficulty, why that one might not be as clear. So if any of you are watching, that's probably the reason. So we're here and here. OK, now we're in the shoulder-width stance.
45 degrees, 45 degrees. And the important thing is learn to shift your weight to get that to happen. Um, generally, when once we're here, we go like this and like this. So that gets you the shoulder width stance. When we go like this, where we kind of spin this direction on the ball of the foot and then turn this direction, that's how we go forward and back, forward and back. One, two. So one of the things that's important about this is really learning to take you in a direction. One, two, three, four. Now, you know, a lot of you have been watching. Maybe you can, if you know how, you know, on the uh, YouTube, you can actually uh, comment or ask a question. Now, when I go forward and back and I talk about pivoting and adjusting your feet, you know, if this has been helpful for you since you started doing that, sort of chime in and let us know, you know, what, you know, the positive results are from doing these exercises. Is this, is this helping you to steer yourself in a direction? Because, you know, the whole purpose of doing that is get you familiar with how to steer your feet in a direction. Now, we're standing like this. We don't have an option. The only way we can look is forward, but can we move our feet? We don't know which side to move. So if you go like this, that's going to take you in that direction. If you turn like this, that's going to take you in that direction. So that's why what steering in a direction is. Now, if I want to go forward, I actually have to straighten my feet. Then it's going to take me in this direction. So what you, you get from that, what what's, are you learning from that, is your foot where the, the big toe or the toes really are going to take you into that direction. Okay. So whichever way you want to go, make sure you point your toe and you'll follow that. Okay. So it's sort of like following your nose. It's going to take you forward. So you follow your nose. If you bring your toe over here, and put your nose tracking your foot, then you're going to head in this direction. Okay, so that's what you have to do. Because so we use our body as a reference point. Once we turn in a direction, you start to go in that direction. Okay, so that's steering. We're doing that here when we're in this forward position. I mean, in heel heel position. I started going that. Now if I sit back. I want to go in this direction, then I pivot on the heel and I head here. If I want to come back towards you, I pivot on this and I straighten this foot on the ball. So you have a toe and a heel. I go forward and back. I have a heel and a toe, a toe and a heel. I go forward and back. I have a heel and a toe. So if that's not uh, too difficult, then confusing, then you should practice that more just to get the feeling of it. Because the more you practice, you know, the more your body is familiar with it, and the more you see this, then it becomes something that you know, and you pay attention to that all the time, because you want to bring those concepts, you know, here into the body. So your body, you know, will be familiar with how to get, you know, into a position. So that's really just pointing your toe to a forward position. So we stand like this, shoulder width, that's what we're doing. If I shift, I bring it to center. I shift, I bring it to center. So I move across till I balance. So this is still a connection to ground, but it's a relationship. I have more weight on this leg than this one. And once I get at some point when I feel balanced, I can actually pick this foot up. If I shift my weight over to this side, I'm still connected to ground there. So once I get enough and I feel like this is free, then that's your balance point. That's another thing you can experiment with. Now, if you have trouble, you're a little bit cautious about whether you can do that or not, use your counter, your kitchen counter. Put your hand on that lightly, um, shift over, and you see if you can touch lightly with the hand and find that balance position. Then go to the other side, shift your weight, and 
find that balance. Now you can't have, unless you have an island, you can't do both sides, so you have to turn around to do this side and then turn around to do this side. So that's if you're doing it in the kitchen. If you're doing it in the living room, you can use one of the chairs. If you're, living, if you're doing it in your dining room, you can use the back of a chair. So use any one of those pieces of furniture or uh, parts of your, your home to do that because uh, those are perfect heights. You know, kitchen counter is about 36 inches. That's generally about the right height your arm can be without actually going up or going way, way down. So that's just, you know, some tips of what you can use at home to help work these drills, right? Okay, now we're going to go to this exercise that we do. It's called silk reeling. So I always want to get you moving and building some coordination. So Jade Lady work shadow, um, pot the horse's mane. You know, these are all names of positions, grass the sparrow's tail. This is, I call silk reeling. And silk reeling really takes you through some of these positions. If I were to kind of dig out a few of the motions in this exercise, we have diagonal flying. We have pot the horse's mane. We have pot the horse's mane or lift and turn or di diagonal flying with a lift. We have the lift that can be part of Jade Lady Work Shuttle. We have the drawdown to hold the ball. We have a setup for cloud hands. And in fact, my right hand is doing a movement similar to cloud hands. And this other hand is doing the coming over the top to give you the top part of hold the ball. So you can see movements are movements. Whatever you can get out of the movements as a support, as a training, it's defining your space. It's defining the direction of movement. It's defining the geometry of position. You know, all of these concepts are probably fairly new to you. And all this terminology that you use is probably fairly new to you. But this is you know, vocabulary that I use frequently to kind of describe what I'm doing. And here we are, diagonal flying with the lift. Bring it down. Slice across. Cover hand. Lift up. J Lady work shut her upper hand. Cloud hands in a circle. Separating and pulling down. All of this stuff is all built into this exercise. Coming down to hold the ball on the top side. Coming down after I make the upper hand movement to here is actually neutral. So here, deep breathing. It's, you know, the things are so obvious but yet not obvious. And the reason why it's not obvious is because of the limited amount of understanding. And people don't think about things the same way I do because I'm teaching it. So when I teach it, I bring up these things so that it could kind of tap into something that will help you remember. You know, one of the things in remember is recall. But what do you recall when it's all, it's all out there and it's all scattered? So you have to use references, whether it's, you know, a term or an idea. You have to build those references as a way to recall information a lot faster. You know, just memorizing a phone number, if you reference something, then the numbers are much clearer. You know, if you um, had, say, a bunch of numbers, you know, um, 8899 or whatever, you just reference certain things. You know, if I had 8899, you know, 88 is a number that you're familiar with. 99 is a number you're familiar with, so you put 8899. Then it becomes easier to remember. So when we talk, when I talk about diagonal flying, silk grilling, and pot the horseman, all of these things, they're all names and terms, but then you 
essentially relate the, the movement to the name and what it kind of looks like. So then uh, over time, you start to build that information. So I know a lot of people, when they're first starting to learn, you say, I can't remember that. I don't know how to do that. I, it's just so, it is difficult in the beginning, but once you see it, and the more you see it, you build mental imagery, because now you get through that imagery, something you can relate to. It's like seeing someone's face. The first time you see their face and then you hear their name, you can't really recall it right away. In fact, before you turn, turn away, you already forgot the name, right? That's, a, that's somewhat what happens. But people that are very good with memorizing names, they correlate that face or that person with something. It could be where you met or could be, you know, many, many things as a reference point just as an idea, then you can recall that person. Or even referencing that person to a person that you already know. And that's a, that's a name that you're familiar with. Then now you start to re recall, well, that's who it is because it clicked, you know, by remember that. Remember that other person. So that's, you know, kind of a way to remember names. So I bring up names because we have postures. So now you see these postures, and I go like this, diagonal flying. Well, diagonal flying is, is a term that you can say, take it and say, well, when I repeat it, diagonal flying, you would say it again, diagonal flying. Then you leave it. What did he say? So think of diagonal flying as something go on the diagonal. It's sometimes called slant diagonally. So what's a diagonal? It's a goes from point A to point B, from corner to corner. So that's what we mean by diagonal. You know, I mean, diagonal can come in different forms, but that's the one we're talking about. Go to the corners. So we know what a corner is. It's a reference. You know, down the corner, like in, back in the day, you had to go down to the corner store. Why did I call it a corner store? Because the store was on a corner. So it gives you that reference point. So when we speak of corners, we're talking about 45 degrees because then you think yourself standing in a square. So when we're in a square in the center, you have four corners. Okay. So Tai Chi is actually standing in a box, a square in the center, and you have four corners, really four corners and the four sides gives you an octagon. So Tai Chi is actually done kind of an octagon. It is an octagon, in fact. And we reference those corners as a guideline of where we're going. So without taking the full eight corners and we stand like this, really all we have to do is do, deal with two corners and a center. So if I turn this way, I'm going to that corner. I turn this way, go to that corner. Okay. Now if I stand here, I don't have to deal with two corners. So really, 45 degrees in a corner, 90 degrees is all you have to deal with. I turn here. There's my new center and my two corners. I turn here. There's my new center and my two corners. If you reference those directions, you know you only have to move your feet 45 degrees to get to where you have to go. If I want to move it more than 45 degrees, I have to turn, bring this here, turn again. That's mechanically how we would get 45 to 45 because 45 and 45 combined is 90 degrees. So we think of 90 here, center line is 45 and 45. So that's something that you can remember now because we're saying, okay, we're standing in a box, we have four corners, but we only have to do with two corners. So two corners in the center gives you 90 degrees, so we only have to really deal with 90 degrees. So that's become something that you will start to reference. Okay, everything is turning. So when you start to do the form, and I'm facing you there, and I'm going over there, I really, this is 90 degrees from where I started. So that's uh, kind of what I reference or talk about is the geometry of your form. So geometry of your form has to do with triangles, okay, squares, square feet, and circles. When we're going like this, that's a half of the upper circle. Now, we think of, a cir think of a circle as one big, giant, round thing. Could be, you know, and the, the size of circle is really related to the, the radius that gives you a diameter. So when I'm here, and I'm here, I have two arcs here, which is 
one half of a circle, right? When I go like this, that's a complete circle. When I'm like this, that's a complete circle. Here and here is a complete circle. So you can see why I use these reference points. Horizontal, we do this in the first, okay, first movement. Horizontal, vertical, square. So while this is square here, if I lift my hands up to here, it's still square. Okay. So that's kind of giving you an idea of what the geometry of position is. So that when we do these movements, you're going to end up realizing, okay, now it starts to make sense because we're dealing with some simple you know, principles. Now then we have the center line, the nose. Here's your center line. One foot on each side of the center line is balanced. I shift over, I'm on one side of the center line, I shift over on the other side of the center line. Depending on what you're doing, go to one side of that line or the other side of that line. And when you're starting to imagine that that's, there's that center line, now you're going to either side of that center line and that's the support line on either side. Now we probably can't imagine in the beginning, but what you're feeling is your spine, your tailbone is going over the heel of that supporting foot. That's on one side of that line, and we shift with this side of that line. So unless you kind of visualize it like that, you don't know that your body is actually going over to this side, over that side, because your body's not used to it, because it hasn't calculated how much it needs to go from one side to the other to determine where your center of mass is. Now, because our body's not distorted in these different postures, it's very easy to find that center of mass because it's all on this line. That's here, but it's also here. When I go like this, there's a line that's here that's splitting my body front to back. What distorts the front to, ba front to back with the center line here is this. So if my body is lined up like this in this plane, this is going to be distorting. So if you look from the side view, and my forehead is here, and my back and tail is here, my body becomes this wide. But yet my body base is only this wide. Of course you're going to be off balance. So if you're leaning forward, you're going to go forward because you have forces acting on your body. So one of the things that you have to avoid when you're walking or moving is to lean forward. Now, when I lean forward, my butt actually goes backwards. It will compensate to find a balance point. It doesn't take a whole lot of strength to do that. But if you're going forward without letting your, back, your butt go backwards, then you're really top-heavy because you haven't counterbalance your body positioning. So that's why, you know, when I speak of body, form, and position, that's what we're dealing with. Now that's what we deal with in Tai Chi. That's what we're dealing with everything that we're learning to do. But in your case, all of these has to be understood as a principle or concept. Then, you know, as you do these exercises, you start to understand, well, this is why my body has to be here. This is why I feel off balance. This is why I can't move my feet because I'm not shifting my weight. And why can't I is because we lost not just the control, but how we used to do this or how we're supposed to do this. So we learn from doing these side-to-side -side movements and how we shift before we move that foot. And don't forget I told you that your feet determine the direction by where the toe is pointing. So when you move your foot and you move forward, make sure your toes are pointing in the direction you're headed. I mean, that's common sense logic. You know, it's logical to do that. Until we talk about it, you did, it didn't really dawn on you. So now that it dawns on you, now you say, okay, now, now that makes a lot of sense. This is what I should constantly be doing as something that will help me 
walk better, turn corners better, stay balanced better, and kind of help you without worrying about falling over because that's what we're just talking about is that you don't want to lean forward, have your momentum going forward and trying to always get your feet to catch up with where your body's going. If you stay in a balanced position when you take that step, there's no forward lean other than the projection of your body. So even if you wanted to lean, you can adjust your body so your spine is always in that vertical position, and then you're going to walk forward and control your center of mass as you go backward and forward. That happens in everything that we do. Okay, ready? Deep breathing. Inhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. So, you know, these classes, even though we're doing a lot of physical movement, it, it almost becomes a lecture because, you know, if we don't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, the tendency is to not to do it. So, you know, the whole goal with this is to make sure you understand the process, you know, why and what it does. So those, those have to be answered so that when you're doing these exercises that you have a goal and you also have an understanding of why we have to do this so, so it works. Because it doesn't, um, doesn't happen if you don't really understand it. You're just running through the motions because then it becomes, um, you know, really not getting that message into the body. So that, that's something that I think is really important is to understand just those basic things that I talked about. Most people that teach this will, you know, especially Tai Chi, will not... Uh, think of it along these lines because, you know, it's just about moving your arms and not even moving at all. That's really uh, not the way to go because movement is essential and without moving your body, whether it's twisting or shifting or stepping, if you don't do these things, you're not practicing something. We did just finish this. Remember what this is called? Silk reeling. So what is silk reeling? You think of reel when you reel. If you're a fisher, fisherman or fishing, someone that a fisher, fishing person, you know, fish, fisherman might not, that's an old term, it might not be accepted. But if you do that, it's a reel, right? So what's a reel? It winds. And what's it winding? Thread, uh, maybe string, or silk. So silk reeling is reeling silk. And what's Reeling silk, it's like they call it reeling silk from a cocoon. So what's a cocoon? It's that little capsule that you know, the, the silkworm produces, and inside there is this spool of silk. And when you pull the thread out, it comes out like it's unreeling. So that silk reeling idea is to have your movements flow through continuously with, with the not ending or breaking. So that's what silk reeling is. So when we do something like this, it doesn't break. It's continuous. It's fluid. That's what silk reeling is. So they say movements is like reeling silk. So that's um, sort of the, the explanation for that. Now that I explained it like that, you probably will remember that as silk reeling a lot better. So that's why... You know, sometimes the explanation makes a difference in clarity of thought or clarity of, the, um, of what we're just doing. So, but that's a great exercise because of the sh you have the forward, you have the back, you have dimensional change, which is moving in space. You have a hand moving up and down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there's a question on how to breathe when we do these movements. When we do any specific exercise, like deep breathing exercise, I, a lot of times I speak to um, breathing through your nose, both inhalation and exhalation. In Tai Chi or any of the uh, disciplines that I teach, we always breathe through the nose. Now, that's ideal if you have a breathing problem or if you have you know, issues with... Um, controlling that, 
then it's fine to breathe through your nose and your mouth, but the thing is, uh, breathing through your mouth is not the way we would prefer. Uh, so breathing through your nose is the ideal way of doing it. Um, certain exercises or certain movements that are continuous, you can just breathe naturally. Breathe when you have to. It's not, uh, not like, weight, like lifting weights. They want you to uh, exhale when you have the power stroke or inhale um, when you're back and then exhale. So we do that on exhalation should happen during sort of when you're exerting strength, and inhalation should be when you're in sort of the gathering part of that movement. In standing positions, just breathe naturally through the nose, kind of a long breath, pretty balanced, inhale and exhale about the same. In something like this, which we will do, exhale, when I say exhale, inhale, that's time with the stroke of the movement. So that's a exerting, exhale, you know, go. Ex inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. So you exhale on the exertion side of that because you're pressing down. So you exhale on the back, inhale on the front stroke. In that case, we would coordinate breath and movement. But typically, you know, downward movement is exhale, rising movements as I inhale. So how do you kind of remember that? That's a, that's a basic concept because sometimes when we do movements, it has a combination of inhalation, exhalation as a rhythm. That's what it is. So rising and falling, you would inhale on the rise and exhale on the fall or the descending. So think of this as a balloon. When you fill it with air, it floats. When you take the air out, it starts to decline. So when you inhale, you're light. Exhale is heavy. Inhale. Exhale. So that's typically movement and breath. That's breath and movement. That's actually what qigong is, breath and movement is in coordination. So the simple things that we do, inhale and exhale. We're doing that when we do the stretch. We inhale and exhale. But when you bend and you move, then you sometimes sustain the breath but not hold it with a lot of pressure. So the ear has to be out. The pressure's gone, and then you let the body go through the motions, and then you go up and you go down. So that's kind of, a, you know, in a nutshell, that you coordinate your movement when it's specific to certain actions. But generally, when we're doing a lot of different movements, we don't have to focus totally on it. And as you evolve, it will actually start to um, coordinate. When we do this, you inhale and you expand, right? Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. So that gives you an idea. When you expand, you can exhale too. Let it out. Exhale. Because you're exerting it here, sinking is here, right? You, can, you inhale, exhale. Then you sink. Now you fall. So because there's a series of movement here, inhale, exhale. Now once you finish exhale, you inhale, exhale. Now this is, say, well, you're really going down. Why aren't you exhaling? You can actually do it that way, too. You can inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. So what does that tie into as a concept of, well, when do you inhale? It really has to do with which part of the focus you want as the exertion part of it. So if you're exhaling, then you're sort of letting it out. If you're expanding, then you can inhale, and then the effort is on the downstroke, then you can exhale. So that's something that you can play around with depending on mood. But don't uh, over-breathe because then your breathing and your movement, meaning the timing, will sometimes get mistimed, and then you could have other problems. Like you might get a little dizzy because you're not uh, coordinated correctly. But the thing is, breath you know, is a natural thing, so just breathe as naturally as you can. Just let your body adapt. 
So why is there expansion and contraction in our breath? Because we have to release and relax this. So if you have a lot of trouble uh, breathing correctly, it's mainly not because of that. It's because your body's too tense. If you have a lot of stress, um, anxiety, or maybe um, worrying about something, you're going to go into the stress mode, and stress mode is sort of like a panic stage, and then your breathing's going to become irregular because your body is tense. So what we're trying to do when we do this, when we do this, is to free up the body and allow the breath to happen naturally. So when you expand and you contract, it's all, all about rising. It's really expanding this and letting it go. Expand here and let it go. So what's that expansion contraction? It's your skeletal structure in this area that's allowing for volume and you know, expansion D and collapsing because the volume of space is expanding and contracting as part of that balloon. So that's kind of how you have to think of it. But through the nose if you can, um, can't really uh, emphasize that, but if you can't, then and some people have a little trouble because all your life you've been breathing through your nose or maybe all your life you've been breathing through your mouth. So, you know, it, it does uh, make a difference over time, but try the best you can. Um, you will breathe you know, when you have to anyway. So I, I sometimes bring up the analogy of um, drinking water and when do you breathe? You actually don't because you block that passageway so water doesn't go down the wrong tube. Otherwise, you start to choke. And sometimes that happens because you forget or the, the body didn't adapt correctly. Okay, now, when we're here, okay, we have the silk reeling and then we have a cross-hand position like this. And this is just opening and closing. Opening and closing. Open and close. So in this exercise, we're usually doing it like this. Right? We just kind of did that earlier, right? So if expanding, if this is easier, Exhale, inhale, exhale. So that's the simplest expand and contract. On the other side, expand and contract. Okay, then we stand like this. So here's lifting. What do we do? Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. So while we're somewhat coordinating that, it's really getting this to cooperate with the movement. Let it relax and sink. Relax and sink. And you know what happens when you relax? You become more stable. And when we sink, the center of gravity actually becomes more focused here, and your center of mass is more stable and relaxed. So the ultimate goal is to relax and let your movements happen without conflict. Let your joints move, folding and pressing and unfolding, and you will constantly build that motion. So let's, before we go further, get that leg work in where we're, we're doing this, okay? So this and this is one. So if you're walking like this, going forward, your hand should go forward too. So when you go backwards, your hands have that relationship. So the forward movement, when I do that, when I take my first step, so just that's the natural gait. When I go like this, if my right foot goes forward, my right hand, left hand goes forward. My right hand goes back. That's in a sense of counterweighting and counterbalancing, but that's a coordination. That's a natural co coordination. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and 
A. Okay, now I'm going to do it on the other side. Remember, initiate. So the left goes forward, the right goes forward. One. Okay, let's reset. One. One. So when you're doing this exercise, you might have a little trouble getting it started because you're not sure how it should be. So the simplest way is just, just to do this. So why do it like that? Because you, you have to overcome the mental block for which foot goes first, and then it doesn't become, well, what's he doing? You just react to that to be the best you can. And then once you do that, and you alternate the hands and legs, you don't swing. You're just taking a forward step, a backward step, forward step, backward step, forward step, backward step. And your back is actually turning a little bit. So you see, now how, do you, how can you tell my torso is turning a little bit? Look at this strip on my shirt. You see it moving? It's moving because my body is turning to compensate for the balance in that position. So that's what you have to kind of pick up on. So a lot of times, what are you looking at? You're looking at the hands, you're looking at the feet, you're looking at the body. You, you look at each one of those things separately, then you start to realize, well, that, that's moving. So then when you do this on your own, you would realize that that has to be part of it. Okay. Now, if I go from side to side, you see my arms are going to the side, and I go that way, my leg goes that way. I come this way, and out. So this kind of merges in the middle and goes beyond, merges in the middle, goes beyond, merges in the middle, and goes beyond. So where is it going through? It's going right through my center. So where's my center? Well, when I go like this, my center is here. Because I have one piece there and one piece there. Now, these are two arms, but this would not feel right if I did that. There's actually more going on here. So this gives me the, the best counterbalancing. And also, because my body starts to go like this. If I go like this, my body can't really do that. Because if my body did this, it would throw me off. So you see, your body, and what you're trying to develop is control of the center of mass and equal, opposite, and counterbalancing of motion. So, you know, if you're a, maybe you're a, an artist and you're maybe doing, working with figurines or maybe working with, um, you know, pottery or, you know, making different configurations. Well, if you were just molding something in a circle and you just dropped it right there, it's pretty balanced so it doesn't move anything. But then you add something on one side, then the thing wants to start to roll. Well, if it starts to roll, then you've got to put something on the other side so it balances. So when we're going into positions, we're constantly adding those pieces on. Those pieces in the human body become forces, become weight. So all of that, what distorts the shape is what you add on the outside. Now it adds forces and forces. So that's what we're dealing with. And how do we, you know, if you're making something, an object, then you can add that and kind of play around with it to see if it's going to balance. But with the human body, and we want to find balance, it really comes down to how it feels when we're in that position. So that's another level of you know, practice, is to dis discover what that feels like. That feeling and your sensitivity and your sensory system work hand in hand. That's a natural course of your practice, a natural understanding that your body will start to become familiar with what that should feel like versus what imbalance feels like. Imbalance, we all know. It goes, your system goes into sort of this panic mode and you can't try to recover. But we typically can't recover as well because our response time is very slow. So the best thing to do is stay as controlled as you can. Then you don't really have to respond by over-responding and excessive. That's what happens when someone falls. You respond and you can't respond, to prop, respond properly, so what do you end up doing? You panic, and what happens when you panic? You get stiff and tight, 
And what happens after you get stiff and tight? No more control. Boom. That's, and that's what falling happens. That's what happens when you fall. So that's why if we can understand that process and try to control it by taking everything back to basics. Okay, so where are we now? Um, okay, so let's do this first. We'll carry Tiger to the mountain. There's a transition. Then we have the infinity sign. So I just want to do a few of these hand movements so you get the upper body moving. Now when we do all of this stuff, opening and closing and lifting, what's it doing? It's tied to here. This is the stiffest and the most awkward part of our anatomy because we don't actually move this. And then if, if you're you know, not used to it, you can't turn, it becomes very, very rigid. That's being dysfunctional. So we have to bring some functionality to the movement. So we begin to feel like we have an expansion and a contraction, expansion, and a contraction. We form the fist. It's an action, but what are we doing? We're learning to maneuver the hands and maneuver the elbows and shoulders. And then we have our center position, which is this, the triangle. So these movements are very basic, but they're essential. Why? They're the geometry of your positions. So that's important to find where your body should be in, in these positions. Now, this is easy because it's balanced. Center line. Center line. Thumbs up. Half circle. Full circle. Half circle. Crossed hands. Elbow down. Elbow out. Elbow down, elbow out. But we interchange between the two to create a transition, but also a relationship. The relationship is that they're working together as, you know, passive or active, a driving force and a responding force. Right? So what do you mean by that? When I go drop my elbow, if I'm relaxed, then this is going to go for the ride. If I relax, then this is going to go for the ride. When I'm relaxed, it goes for the ride. One, two, three, four. So what is that? That's movement as a function of. What's a function of? It moves because something else caused it to move. It's not just moving. Okay, so functions of become a phenomena in the body when you move this response, and response is reaction, and reaction becomes something that you have to control. So that's why it's kind of important to understand, you know, the, the method to this madness that we're actually building more understanding up here so that we can turn that understanding into functionality and motion. But if you can do that and build off of these simple exercises, you're going to see that there's going to be improvement and everyone varies, so that improvement, if you could feed back, you know, what's happening with this exercise, or that, yeah, I'm beginning to understand it. It's, it's changing um, many ways of uh, how I view things, or how I'm, um, you know, approaching things, which is important because, um, you know, changing an attitude, changing uh, a mindset really has to do with, you know, everything that we're doing. And that should be a positive thing because none of the things that we were doing is really, you know, not going to support um, your movement. Everything we're talking about actually is supportive, is beneficial, you know, in, in the long run, you know, hopefully can prevent any progression of, you know, what's going on, you know, in your body. So uh, with that said, 
I want to do one more exercise. When we go forward, then there's your circle. Remember? Clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. So what is that? That's clockwork. Clockwise, counterclockwise. It's, a, it's really how circles are defined. They either go this way or that way. So it's a cycle, like the world goes around, uh, everything circular goes. So that's why we have these directions of movement. So this is clockwise. It's the same direction the hands move. If they didn't just move in one direction, your timing would be kind of confused. So when we're moving, we're really developing timing. So timing is a function of how we're going to be moving. So when this is clockwise and this is counterclockwise, we're going to move clockwise to go forward. We're going to go counterclockwise to go backwards. So isn't that how a clock works? We're going to go forward clockwise. We're going to go backwards counterclockwise. Now we're going to start with the right when we go clockwise, and we start with the left going counterclockwise. So that's something that you can remember. Clockwise, forward, counterclockwise, backwards. Going forward, you go to the right, left, right, and backwards, you go left, right, left. So how do you get forward and backward, other than in Europe where they drive the opposite way. In America, we drive on the right side, we go forward. And then when we go backwards, it's going the other way, that's on the left side. So you can remember right and left easily like that. Just stay on the right side and then go forward, all right? Stay on the right side, go forward, and go clockwise. And you go backwards, counterclockwise, you know. I don't know, I'm old enough to remember, and a lot of you probably do too, but when you first learned to drive, you didn't have those great directionals that they have today, and people didn't have air conditioning, air condition, so the windows were always open. So you're driving down the street, and you're going to take a turn like that. That's a right-hand turn. And then when you, that's going that way, right? So you're turning that way, and you go that way to go that way. Or they had a a time when they would go like this to go right. So, you know, hand signals changed a lot over time, and then this was stop. This was a left turn. That would be a right turn. That's easy, but then they had this one where you go like that to go to the right. So, you know, it's just uh, how things have evolved. We don't even use hand signals anymore. It's just kind of using that lever. So it just shows you you know, when we're moving in space, we have hands as gestures. So gesturing is telling you what to do. When we go like this, I call that covering. Like when we do like this, hold the ball. This is coming like this. Come in this direction, you're taking you over there. Take it this direction, go over here. So really, clockwise, forward, right, left, right, and then left, right, left, counterclockwise, forward, like this. Here. Okay? And you can see. And then if we're here, you go to the right, you go to the left. You go to the right, you go to the left. So when the hands are like this, you have a left side, you have a right side. This takes us over there, this takes us over there. So if you turn to the right and you turn to the left, if you do that 10 or 15 times a day, you're going to work your back, you're going to twist your body, and that's going to help you become more agile and mobile here. If you expand like this up on the toes when we do a deep breathing, inhale, exhale. So the person that asked about breathing, expand. Inhale, down, exhale. So just use that breathing exercise as a guideline. And then, um, you know, that's the most fundamental way of breathing. There's other techniques of breathing that's a little more, more uh, complicated, but that's the most basic. So anyways... Uh, hope you enjoyed this content. Share it. Like I said, go to YouTube, subscribe, get your friends. Anybody in the globe can actually do this. We have a lot of people following us uh, from the UK. People in the Parkinson Foundation actually, um, you know, has this on their website. And, you know, it's for everybody. Anybody with Parkinson's can do this. Um, you know, we're still working toward um, getting everyone to understand, you know, how beneficial the Tai Chi paradigm is to Parkinson's, and it's something that um, you know I really believe in these exercises. Um, 
and this whole program, I developed it uh, from my years of experience, and I have over 60 years of experience uh, teaching martial arts. So uh, it's a motor skill uh, training for me. It's a, uh, because Parkinson's a motor skill disorder in, in some sense, that these mo exercises will support everything that you're doing or everything that uh, you're not doing. So on that note, see you next time. It's archived, so stream it in.